Hey everybody, this is History Student Reacts, and welcome back to another Historia Civilis reaction. Now, if you're following intently uh, the chronological order in which I'm reacting, you may notice that I have skipped a couple of videos. Uh, it's because there is a bunch of very old Historia Civilis videos, which, you know, the audio quality is a little degraded, they, they're not necessarily up to the standard of the modern ones. So I decided to put them on Patreon as Patreon-exclusive reactions. So if you want to see them, my Patreon is linked down below. You can go click on that and subscribe, and you'll be able to see my exclusive reactions to some of the older Historia Civilis videos, along with other exclusive reactions coming up in the future. Anyway, the video we're reacting to today is the Pontifex Maximus. Uh, I believe that was the highest religious official of Rome. I'm excited to get into this one. I hope you guys are too. So let's just jump right in. In 63 BCE, at the age of 36, Julius Caesar shocked everybody by announcing that he was running for the office of Pontifex Maximus. Ah. He was still a minor political figure. He had not yet served his term as preacher. Ah. He took on massive debts in order to finance this campaign. And when his political elders tried to convince him to get out of the race, he... As we learned in some of the Patreon exclusive videos, Quester is sort of where you start. You know, you're sort of a bit like a sort of assistant to provincial governors or other important figures. And then Praetor is where you get really important. Praetor is a very important role in Roman society. They, uh, you know, it's sort of like a judge with other responsibilities. So he's saying this is before Caesar was a Praetor. This is before he'd held that pretty major position of power. He redoubled his efforts and threw himself even further into debt. On election day, according to Plutarch, Caesar told his mother something along the lines of, Today, you will either see me as Pontifex Maximus or go into exile. Mm. He won a close three-way race. This electoral victory would have repercussions for centuries. So what was the Pontifex Maximus? Let's put it in the simplest possible terms. He was the highest elected religious official in the Roman Republic, right. and once elected, he served for life. You'll notice that I threw a caveat in there, elected. Mm -hmm. Maybe it won't surprise you to learn that it gets more complicated when you look into it. Of course, it there always does. There was one person that outranked the Pontifex Maximus. He was called the Rex Sacrorum, which is deceptively hard to say. It <laughs> means something like the King of the Sacred. Wow. Once appointed, he also served for life, kinda. The Rex Sacrorum was actually itself a split position, consisting of a husband and wife team. Oh. The wife was called the Regina Sacrorum, and she had duties separate from her husband. One could not exist without the other, so if one of the two died or the couple got divorced, the position was vacant and a ah. new couple was appointed. The o How many positions can you think of throughout history that were served, uh, like official positions that were husband and wife duo? Um, I'm sure others have existed. I can't think of any others, um, but th that's very interesting. Like an appointed position where you have to have a husband and wife duo to do it. That that's really unique, I think. Official job of the Rex and Regina Sacrorum was to keep the gods happy. Full stop. <laughs> that's it. Wow. What that meant in practice was that they were each responsible for performing many complicated religious ceremonies, including animal sacrifices. They also had to live a pure life, which meant a lot of things, but most importantly, it meant that politics and the military were completely off limits. Uh. The Rex Sacrorum was undeniably a powerless figurehead. But let's put that to the side. Let's look at the Pontifex Maximus's actual responsibilities. I'd say his most meaningful job was regulating public morality. He was a watchdog over the Roman people and more importantly, over its politicians. He had the power to unilaterally issue fines whenever he decided that somebody violated a religious custom or wow. a cultural taboo. Along the same lines, he was also authorized to go before the Senate and speak on legislation representing a group called the College of Pontiffs. See, I mean, that's a very powerful position. I, I I mean, can you imagine having a position like that in your society today? I mean, if you live in a, like, theocracy, you probably can, but I think myself and a lot of the people who watch these videos probably live in more secular uh, Western countries. 
And this is obviously a very unusual thing to have sort of a chief of morality. Very weird. Um, of course, in more religious countries, both today and throughout history, this would not seem so unusual. Having someone to relate uh, to uh, regulate the morals of your country in accord with your religion. You know, that, that's been an idea that's happened for uh, a long time. But it's, it's a very odd idea to me to try and imagine having a position like that in our society. Since you're giving a lot of power to this person. Um, and they, you know, there's not a whole lot of accountability there. Since they're supposedly, you know, serving your religion. What was the College of Pontiffs? This was a group of pontiffs or priests that met with the Pontifex Maximus behind closed doors to vote on new laws that would govern religious life or public morality. Wow. It's important to note that once these laws were agreed upon and publicly announced by the Pontifex Maximus, they had the force of law and the Senate had no say in the matter. I mean, look, look at that power. They can debate on these laws amongst each other in private and then just release them. You know, proclaim them, and they are law. No input from your uh, legislature. That's a pretty high degree of power, uh, even though it's sort of constrained to one area of life. In the beginning, there were five in the college, later nine, and by the late Republic, 15. Mm. These pontiffs had some other duties, like serving as judges in religious court cases, although it's unclear how common this was. Hmm. Their most important job was becoming experts on Roman religious law and guiding the Pontifex Maximus. Keep in mind that these pontiffs were expected to have normal political careers, and their role on the College of Pontiffs was kind of a side gig. Just like the Pontifex Maximus, pontiffs served for life. When a pontiff died, the college voted internally to select his replacement. New pontiffs were usually picked from prominent families at a young age and trained on the job by their colleagues. Briefly, in the late Republic, new pontiffs were elected by the people, but that reform didn't last long. Oh. The Pontifex Maximus also oversaw a group called the Flamen. These men were also priests, but appointed directly by the Pontifex Maximus for life. Wow. There were 15 of them each the head of a cult devoted to a different deity, the flaming. And I, I, I will say, to, today the word cult has a pretty negative connotation, but here it's being used in an objective sense, so if you hear the word cult and you think, oh no, well, you know, uh, it's not necessarily that, it's more just, uh, you know, sort of a group dedicated to a uh, certain god. Uh, it's not a cult in this sense that, you know, what I'm saying is there, you shouldn't think about it negatively. I mean, you shouldn't necessarily think about it positively, but, you know, Historia Civilis is using it in sort of an objective sense without any moral judgment. Even though today, if you apply the word cult to something, you tend to think very bad things about it. ...into Jupiter, Mars, and Romulus were the three most prestigious ones, and were usually given to members of prominent families. Hmm. Unlike the pontiffs, flamen were subject to a litany of religious restrictions. For example, it was forbidden for them to see a dead body or to travel outside of Rome. This meant that while wow. they were technically allowed to have political careers, all of the good stuff was off limits. Mm. Also, they weren't allowed to see a table without food on it, which might be the world's worst superpower. <laughs> I can't decide if it would be more annoying to know a flamen or to be a flamen. That's true. That, that's very true. Because if you are a flamen, it's like, ah, oh, sir, there's a table, avert your eyes. If you know a flamen, it's like, uh, you know, George is coming over, set the table again, set the table. <laughs> yeah, that's got to be kind of a, a bit of an inconvenience. The Pontifex Maximus was also responsible for appointing Vestal Virgins, which was ah. an order of women that maintained an eternal flame in the center of the city. Yeah. These were easily the most powerful women in Rome. They could own property, vote, and even free slaves at will. Wow. Each one was appointed for 30 years, but most chose to stay on after their time was up. That's very powerful. The Pontifex Maximus worked right next door to the Temple of Vesta in a building called the Regia, which had once been the site of the royal palace during the monarchy. Mm. This was where the College of Pontiffs met. It's also where Rome housed its official calendar, which was so broken that the Pontifex Maximus needed to manually add days to the end of every year in order for it to make sense. 
Yeah. This was also where Rome's most sacred artifacts were kept. Perhaps most famous were the Spears of Mars, which were said to vibrate whenever Rome was about to befall some disaster. Ooh. We are told that Caesar saw them vibrating the night before his own assassination. Uh -oh. Speaking of which, after Caesar's assassination, one of his deputies, Lepidus, was elected the new Pontifex Maximus. This same Lepidus became the junior member of the Second Triumvirate with Octavian and Mark Antony. After Octavian became the Emperor Augustus and consolidated power, he forced Lepidus to move to the countryside, where he retained his title but no influence. Years later, when Lepidus died of old age, the office passed to Augustus without much fuss, and the headquarters of the Pontifex Maximus quietly moved from the Regia to the new Imperial Palace. And mm. for the next 400 years, that's where it stayed. I mean, that's a little look at the consolidation of power under the future emperors of Rome, where all these different offices begin to be consolidated under one man. Um, so yeah, that was a really interesting one. Got to learn a bit about the highest elected religious official in the city. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I certainly found it interesting. Uh, I will see you again next time. Hope you guys are having and will have a good day. Uh, and I will see you again. Goodbye.